one of the oldest questions ever asked by humanity is, are we alone? And the modern version of this question that astronomers are asking is, how do we scan the heavens to find out? So in the next 18 minutes, I want to bring, bring you on a grand tour of how modern astro, exoplanet astronomers, I'm sorry, are attempting to address this very old question. You should take three things away from my talk. The first is that we, the exoplanet astronomers, are the modern descendants of Giordano Bruno, whom I'll tell you about in a moment. The second is a paradox. We seem to know much less about nearby stars and their exoplanets than those that are very far away. And the third is that for the first time in human history, we have a way of scanning worlds very far away to tell you about possible signs of life. So my story, or our story, starts with Giordano Bruno, who lived in the 16th century. Giordano, Giordano was an iconoclast, meaning that he really liked to piss people off. And he was eventually executed for heresy, but not before uh, making the following statement, which is, there are countless suns and countless earths, all rotating around their suns, in exactly the same way as the planets of our system. You need to appreciate that this was a very radical statement at that time in human history. You could get into a lot of trouble for saying this. But it turns out he was right. It turns out that if you just stare at stars in the sky, by dumb luck, some of these stars will have planets that pass in front of them that cause a little tiny dip in the light called a transit. And this is the method by which the Kepler Space Telescope has discovered thousands of planets orbiting other stars beyond our solar system, known as exoplanets. Here's a way to visualize these discoveries. So I'm showing you a chart in which I'm showing the size of the exoplanet in Earth units versus the orbital period in days. And so the Earth on this chart would have a size of one and a period of 365 days. Immediately, you see two surprises. The first surprise is that there seems to be a population of exoplanets with roughly the size of our Jupiter, but orbiting with periods of a few days and not 12 years. This means that their atmospheres are really hot, thousands of degrees hot. But by far the, the bigger surprise, at least to me, is that there are exoplanets with sizes between that of Earth and Neptune. There is no such planet in our solar system, no example of such a super-Earth. And this teaches you a very important lesson, which is that if you would like to understand exoplanets, in the nearby universe, you can't just look in the solar system, you need to look beyond. Here's another surprise. You may be surprised to know that in our cosmic neighborhood, the sun is actually not a typical star. A typical star is redder, is dimmer, and is cooler in temperature. And they are usually called red dwarfs. Not so far away is a red dwarf called Trappist-1, and very recently, just in the last few months, astronomers, including my colleagues at Bern, discovered seven Earth-sized or smaller exoplanets orbiting the Trappist-1 star in a very tight configuration. In fact, the configuration is so tight that you can fit the entire system within the orbit of Mercury in our solar system. But because Trappist-1 is cooler than the Sun, it's half the temperature, it's still possible that even though they are so close, that some of these exoplanets could have water on their rocky surfaces. And the really, the only way to tell is to study the atmospheres of these planets. So I just told you that we have discovered thousands of exoplanets, but the reality is that only a handful of them are close enough for us to study their atmospheres. And here's a way to visualize that challenge. I'm going to show you a chart again of the size of the exoplanet, again in Earth units, but now I'm going to show you the distance away in parsecs. So a parsec is three light years. A light year is the distance that light travels in one year. It's a very vast distance. Just to, just to give you a sense of how vast this is, it takes light one second to go from here to the moon. So a light year is a very large distance. The, the first thing you see is that the Kepler discoveries in blue are very far away, a few hundred to a thousand parsecs much too far for us to study the atmospheres and tell you if they have water or carbon dioxide and so on. 
There's a new NASA telescope called TESS, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes, that will discover exoplanets 10 times closer, so we have a fighting chance of studying their atmospheres. But by, but by far, the most interesting exoplanets are the ones that are tens of parsecs away. And I just told you about TRAPPIST-1, and the reason why TRAPPIST-1 is interesting is because if you look at the chart, TRAPPIST-1 has the planets, the seven planets of TRAPPIST-1 have roughly the size of Earth. They're at almost 10 parsecs away, very close, almost our garden, our cosmic garden. And uh, the sizes of these circles indicate how easy or difficult it is to detect the transits. So large circle means easy to detect transits. So they have large circles, that's good. But um, there's, a, there's a paradox in this graph, which is, why is this region empty? So the region between us and 10 parsecs is empty. And it's surprising because the statistics tell us to expect thousands of exoplanets, and yet this region is nearly empty. Why is that? Just think about it, right? It's a paradox because we know less about, about the exoplanet population around nearby stars than we know around faraway stars. The paradox comes about because of um, something called the bright star paradox. So if I was using a telescope on Earth to look at a star with an exoplanet, what I'm really interested in is the tiny dip in light that the transit causes. But because I'm observing through the atmosphere of Earth, which is turbulent, the turbulence typically creates a signal that's comparable to or larger than the signal of the transit. So to check my discovery, I have to point the telescope at a so-called reference star, a star that is roughly the same brightness, roughly the same type, roughly the same temperature, and not too far away. But the problem is that bright stars are very rare in the sky, so it's very rare, almost impossible, to find a bright star a bright reference star next to the bright star you're interested in. And this is the reason why we know almost nothing about exoplanets around bright stars. How do you overcome this problem? You overcome this problem by placing your telescopes in space above the Earth's atmosphere so that you don't have to worry about reference stars. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you about three space telescopes that have either launched or will launch in the next few years that will revolutionize our understanding of exoplanets around nearby stars. The first telescope, as I promised, is called the TESS mission of NASA. Uh, TESS just launched a few months ago successfully on a Falcon 9 rocket. It's now in space, taking data. We'll see the results very soon. And the strategy of TESS is to do an all-sky survey. So it will look at every patch of sky, but the price to pay for such wide coverage is that TESS will only look at each patch for 27 days. This means that the exoplanets that TESS will find will have orbital periods of roughly a week. The next uh, space telescope I will tell you about is called KEOPS. This is our local pride and joy. It's a space mission of the European Space Agency, or ESA. It's led by Switzerland. We are paying 30% of the bill. Um, <laughs> and in fact, it's led by the University of Bern. And the strategy of KOPS is a little bit different. It's not doing the all-sky survey the TESS is doing. Rather, KOPS is looking at golden targets that we found to be interesting in the past that already show hints of showing interesting exoplanets. And we would like to detect the really interesting ones that we can follow up to, to stare at their atmospheres. Together, the two space missions, TESS and KOPS, will deliver a treasure trove of the most interesting exoplanets in the nearby universe that we can then study their atmospheres. So I keep saying atmospheres, but how do you really study the atmosphere of an exoplanet? You do it by, you take the light from an exoplanet and you split it into different colors. It's called a spectrum. It's analogous to taking the fingerprint of a person. So given good enough data, and if you spread the light across enough colors, you can distinguish between, say, water and carbon dioxide, in this example I'm showing you, and the space telescope that will do this really, really well is the most expensive one ever built by humanity. This is the James Webb Space Telescope that will launch in 2021. So I've told you how to detect exoplanets around bright stars. I've described to you how to take their spectral fingerprints. The next logical step is, how do we use these techniques to tell if there's life on an exoplanet? That's the big, big question, right? And the answer is that, I would like to identify a molecule that is not only uniquely associated with life, 
but that can accumulate in large amounts in the atmosphere and exist in the form of a gas. So I can detect it using a telescope and I can look at it in the spectrum. This is called a biosignature. Unfortunately, many of the gases produced by life are also produced by rocks, geology. So the methane produced by this cow will be, may as well come from the ground, I can't really tell. So the challenge of biosignatures is how do I detect signs of biology in the face of geological false positives? That's the challenge. The traditional view of biosignatures is that there's a magic molecule that will tell me once and for all, on all exoplanets in the universe, whether I have life. The modern view of biosignatures is that there's no such magic molecule. Instead, you have to detect a family of molecules. You have to assess the environment from which these molecules emerge, the atmosphere. Then you have, we would have to assign a probability as to whether these fam this family of molecules is associated with biology. So it's a very modern, nuanced view. Fortunately, there's a next generation of giant ground-based telescopes to assist in the hunt for biosignatures in the nearby universe. And the one that I'm most excited about is European. It's called the European Extremely Large Telescope, very imaginative name. <laughs> there's a 39-meter mirror. We joke that the next telescope is called the Humongously Large Telescope. So, so it's a 39-meter mirror, and just look at the picture, just check out how small that truck is next to the telescope. This thing costs a billion euros, or will cost a billion euros. It's almost complete. So the, the ELT will take exquisite spectra of molecules in the atmospheres of exoplanets. So this example I'm showing is that of oxygen. If oxygen would exist in an exoplanet atmosphere, this telescope will definitively tell you that it's there. And in fact, you may have seen in the news very recently that um, uh, we found iron and titanium in a very hot exoplanet it's using exactly the same technique. And in fact, the interpretation of such a spectrum reduces to an image recognition problem, very similar to how you analyze images in medicine, which is why at the University of Bern, we are teaming up with the medical scientists to develop interpretational techniques based on artificial intelligence. And this is ongoing work. The, the ones of you who think about this problem may object and say that, but oxygen is not a very good biosignature, and, and you would be right. Because we now understand that there are abiotic ways to make oxygen, so without biology. And one way to do that is using the so-called photolysis of water, meaning that uh, ultraviolet radiation from the light hits the atmosphere of the exoplanet, breaks up the water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen would escape, the oxygen would stay behind, and it looks like it came from life, but it's not biology. Perhaps a better molecule is methyl chloride. On Earth, at least, methyl chloride is uniquely associated with biology. And given good enough data and a spectrum that is covers enough colors or wavelength, we could identify the spectral fingerprint of methyl chloride. But the million-dollar question, or the billion-dollar question given that telescope, is, is methyl chloride a robust biosignature for all of the exoplanets we will find out in the nearby universe? And this is an open question. Looking ahead, NASA is studying four mission concepts for the next generation of space telescope that will be launched in the 2030s and 40s when I'm retired. One of them is called Louvois. And this is the first time in human history that a space telescope is being designed to detect, mainly detect biosignatures. And we on the Louvois team have many questions. How big should the mirror be? So this cartoon shows you the mirrors of the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, which I mentioned, and the Louvois Space Telescope, which has a mirror between 9 and 15 meters, which makes the 2.4-meter mirror of Hubble look very small. If the solar system was 10 parsecs away, roughly 30 light years, this is the photograph that Louvois would take of the solar system. Whose rocket should we use? It always blows my mind that during one of the telecons of the Louvois team, we were having a very serious discussion about whether we should use the next generation rocket of NASA, Elon Musk, or Jeff Bezos. It was a serious discussion with plans and all. How are we going to pay for it? 
But I think the most important question of all is, how common is life in the nearby universe? We believe that Louvois will conduct the most definitive census of extraterrestrial life in the nearby universe, and finally set us on the path to answering the question, are we truly alone? Here's an aspirational picture taken by the Voyager spacecraft. It shows the Earth as a pale blue dot. So you couldn't make out the continents and the oceans and the clouds of Earth in high definition, but if you took a spectrum of this pale blue dot and you studied the signatures, you could make out the presence of ozone, oxygen, water, methane, and carbon dioxide. And you could possibly come to the conclusion that there's something interesting happening on this planet. I would like to end by going back to Giordano Bruno. Remember what he said? He said, there are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as our system, our solar system. We now understand that Bruno was right, and here's the modern take on what Bruno said. There are 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone. At least 10% have exoplanets. There are 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. There's a mind-boggling number of exoplanets. So if we are truly alone, life must be very rare indeed. Or God is playing a joke on us. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs>